All right, make sure I got this on. Woo! Yeah. I'm excited, man. See, what you all excited about? I'm in church and I'm not in jail anymore. Yeah. Been free for 18 years going on. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by his wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out, show me the way. Sound like y'all believe you're free too. Hey man, let's take our Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 40, and I want to preach for a little while. I appreciate Dr. Smith having me out. Man, what a beautiful place. I have not been to the camp meeting in about five years, and Dr. Smith took me out to a good lunch this afternoon and let me look through the church, and man, if you don't see the blessings of God on this property, you need to pray that God get the scales off your eyes. Anybody that would even try to come up against this man of God, this ministry, this property, this tent, and what this man of God's doing, you got a death wish on your head is what you got. You better just back up and leave it alone because God's blessing the hound dog out of this place. And I like it, man. I like to be a part of it. And I just thank God for where he stands. The men and women that are coming up under this ministry that are being taught the truth. And I appreciate it. And Dr. Smith, again, thank you so much for the good motel the good clean place to stay, the good food to eat, the fellowship today, just hanging out with this man of God. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, it was worth my drive up here just to hang out with him for a couple, two or three hours today just so I can go home and say I hung out with Dr. Smith. Just to go home and tell my kids I spent an entire afternoon with Dr. Smith, got a picture of me in the pulpit. I wasn't preaching over there, but I was definitely standing there and uh, so, man, just good memories for me. Isaiah chapter 40, stand with me. We'll be sitting for about 35 uh, minutes or so. Isaiah chapter 40, uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 38, uh, 28, and down, just down through verse 31 for time's sake. I want to hit this thing hard, throw something at you, and I'm really just going to lay about a 15-minute foundation and preach for about 15 minutes. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, <laughs> and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, colon, not a period. Aren't you thankful for the colons in your Bible? But they that wait upon the Lord yes, shall, not might, they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the man of God that preached a few moments ago on go get your stuff back. Lord, I remember the day when I read where David was sitting there looking at the smoke coming up from Ziklag and he approached you and you told him to pursue and he got back his stuff. And God, I set out on a mission 17 and a half years ago to get my stuff back. And I'm thankful that you're good to your word. Just like the preacher said, you will recover all. And I'm glad that you've allowed me to, uh, Lord, you have restored the years that the locust, the canker worm, and the palmer worm and the northern army have destroyed. You have given me my stuff back. You've given me my mind back. You kept my family together. You kept my wife at home. God, you gave me some of my health back. And Lord, I'm glad to know that we can recover all. But Lord, now as we switch gears and we go to a different mode of operation, I pray that you just touch this message. How, oh God, if we've ever needed you, we need you now. Oh, God, send the rain. Give me liberty to preach. Heal my vocal cords. Walk these chairs and these aisles in an old-fashioned way. Send all old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone conviction and impress upon somebody's heart that they can do better, go further, and be more for you in these last days. In Jesus Christ's holy name, I pray it. 
Amen and amen. You can have a seat. This entire chapter, I ain't got time to read it all because I want to head somewhere. But you go home when you feel depressed and read the entire chapter of, of Isaiah chapter number 40. Before you go to bed, you will, you will be forgetting about all of your insignificant problems. You will be thinking of how small you are and how large and in charge our God is. He's dealing with a group of people. I don't have time to get into it all, but they're going to restore. They're going home to rebuild some things. The children of exile have been given the opportunity to go home and rebuild and reconstruct. And, and, and Isaiah has been given a message in the first couple verses, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, and let them know that I am large and in charge. In other words, you're going to restore, you're going to rebuild, and it's not always easy. But don't you ever forget, God says, that I am great and anything that you're trying to accomplish in my name can be completed. That's what God is telling his people. And then he deals with some things throughout the chapter, but I want to zero in on verse number 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. I want to preach for a few minutes on eagle people. Eagle people. Now, there's a lot of characteristics in an eagle that can picture what God wants his children to be. I believe with all of my heart, mind, and soul that if you are saved by the grace of God and you are here tonight or by way of internet listening to my voice, God, if you're saved, God has put within you the characteristics and the instincts of an eagle that God wants to cultivate and manifest in your life. Maybe you're thinking, preacher, I don't have any eagle instincts in me and I don't know of anything about an eagle that, that God would liken unto me as a Christian. Well, I'm here tonight to explain to you some things that maybe you don't even know about so that you will zero in on them, recognize them, and let God produce them in your life. I believe that every person here that's been saved, now if you're not saved, you need to get to this altar and get born again. Don't leave here without Christ being your savior. And then when you do, you can become an eagle people like the rest of us are going to start thinking about after this service tonight. Let me just give you, by the way of introduction, a couple things before I preach. Did you know that, okay, so we've already mentioned, God has, has quoted in his, in his word that we shall mount up with wings as eagles. So if he likens us to an eagle, there's some things about an eagle that we need to develop. Number one, did you know that the eagle is the king of birds? Did you know that you're at the top of the food chain? Did you know that you are more important than any animal God has ever made? Did you know that you have something that, most, that all animals don't have and it's called a soul? And you are more important than the birds. You're more important than the fish in the sea. You are the most important thing on this planet and God wants you to understand that. Did you know that they dwell in high places? Did you know that God does not want you living down in the dumps all the time? Stop letting this world depress you and drive you into the dumpsters of life. God said, now a lot of people think that God saved you and now you've got to live like a pauper or a peasant the rest of your life. I disagree with that. You know, I've got more not just mentally and spiritually and, and maritally, but did you know that I've got more financially than I've ever had in my life by serving God? Did you know that there's some things in your Bible? God doesn't want you living, uh, listen to me, he doesn't want you living in, homeless and in a dumpster all of your life spiritually. God wants you to enjoy life. My good friend, Dr. Larry Brown from North Augusta used to always say, he said, I'm going to get me two scoops of Briar's vanilla and lick it slam to the cone. I'm going to enjoy life. And I'm here to tell you, you're looking at a preacher who's going to enjoy life. God don't want you living second rate. I, I, listen, the Bible says if you will give, he will give back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The Bible says in the book of Malachi that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you and rebuke the devourer. That tells me one thing. There is a devourer that's up against your finances. He's up against your marriage. He's up against your home. He's against your church. He's against your children. But if you will give to God, he will open up the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing, and rebuke the devourer. I believe your truck will get more miles on it. I believe your automator won't give out quite as quick. I believe God will let your clothes last longer. I believe he'll keep the roof from leaking. I believe that if you give, God will do those things if he so chooses to do so. I look back over the past 18 years of my life and I cannot believe 
what God has brought me out of and where he has put me in heavenly places. I, I was sitting at San Jose's several months ago and, and I was just sitting there eating my, my lunch. There was three, three middle-aged men, 20 to 25, maybe 28 years old. And as they were sitting there, they were drinking beer, doing shots and, and cussing and all kinds of stuff. And, and I'm trying to block it out. I just want to eat my lunch and hit the road. I was heading, I think I was heading somewhere in Georgia to preach. And, and these three men went from talking just regular center talk to blaspheming our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the fellows had a picture of Bob Marley on his T-shirt, and one of the other guys had mentioned, hey, that looks like a picture of Jesus I saw one time on a, on a picture. And, and the next thing you know, they're talking about God and Jesus, but it's not in a good way. They are literally blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ as they're drinking their beer and doing their shots. Normally, especially if no one is with me, I will stand up, I will walk over, and I'll do my best to politely say, listen, it's America. You can talk how you want to, but that's my Lord and Savior you're talking about. Listen, you better lower your voice or talk about him somewhere besides here. But this particular day, as I pushed my plate back, Dr. Smith, I was getting up to walk over and approach those three guys and tell them they needed to be quiet. And Hell's Angels used to have a good saying. I thought about putting it on Sunrise Baptist shirt, T-shirts. Here's what it said. Don't let your tongue get your teeth knocked out. I thought about putting that on the back of one of our Sunrise Baptist shirts, T-shirts. Don't let your tongue get your teeth knocked out. And I was getting ready to walk over to him and pull up one of those old H.A. sayings, but the Holy Ghost said, sit still. I'm going to teach you something. So I sat there. The more they drank, the more they blasphemed. I hurry up, I ate, I was paying my bill, and the three of them got up behind me. And as I walked out to the front door, I stood there. They were paying their bill, and I looked over to my left at that beautiful truck that God's people had provided for me. That F-250, 2020 Platinum. God's people have provided that vehicle for me so that I don't break down on the road traveling all over the country. I looked over at that truck and I was getting ready to walk over to it and I'm thinking, man, God, you've been good to me. You just, I just ate a good meal. I'm getting ready to get in a nice truck, drive over to Georgia and preach for a, a good church. Man, I'm just tears are swelling. I'm thinking, God, you've been good. And I started to walk over towards my truck and the Holy Ghost said, I'm not done yet. I'm gonna show you something. Stand still. I just stood there for a moment wondering what God was doing. And as those three boys had paid for their meal, they walked out right behind me and all three of them got on half broke down mopeds. I'm not here to slam mopeds, but listen to me. I, I went to church that Sunday and preached on God don't want you riding a broke down moped. All three of them boys come out there, Dr. Smith. They was staggering, they was lit, they're cussing, GDing, all the F words and all that stuff. All three of them got on their mopeds. They're trying to crank them up. They're spitting and sputtering and backfiring and falling over and picking one another up. And I'm standing there going, now, isn't that a circus clown of a mess? Three grown men getting on liquor sickles. All three of them, I guarantee you, had DUIs, didn't have a driver's license. That's why they're riding around town on mopeds. Y'all listening to me? All three of them tried to crank them mopeds up. They was backfiring and spitting and sputtering, and, and one of them finally got that moped cranked up, pulls out onto the main road, almost gets run over, falls down. The moped stalls out. The other two are running out there. They're trying to pick him up and get him out of the road. And the Holy Ghost said, now you look at that and you look at what you're driving and tell me, does it not pay uh, to serve God? <laughs> hey, friend, uh, I'm telling you, God don't want you living down in the dumps. Uh, I walked over to them three boys uh, with tears running down my face. I tried to pick them up uh, and tell them about that Jesus they was cussing uh, had saved my soul uh, and God would bless them if they'd simply turn their life over to God. Uh, they didn't want to hear nothing about it. They begin to cuss me and my God. All they wanted was another shot and another beer and another half broke down moped. Y'all listen to me. But God said you'll mount up with wings as eagles and eagles dwell in high places and God doesn't want you living in the dumpsters of life. It's time to rise up and be an eagle people and let God bless your wallet. Amen. I just believe it. Even though they, watch this now, I got to hurry. Did you know that even though eagles are considered foul, they're not as easily produced as chickens or other birds? Eagles are not hatched in a brood or sat on and covered. Eagles are not, uh, uh, chickens can be produced in 21 days, watch this, and ready for the market in eight or nine weeks. I, one of my deacons at my church runs a chicken farm of over a, a million chickens. And he said, listen, he said, those chickens 
from the time the egg is laid in eight to nine weeks, you are eating one at Chick-fil-A. That's fast. That's pretty quick. Amen. But eagles lay only one or two eggs which are incubated by both parents for up to 49 days in larger species. The young stay in the nest for up to 130 days. Then they become fledglings and are fed by both parents. Watch this. Most species of eagles only breed once every other year. Now here's my thought. It takes time to produce greatness. Eagles are not produced overnight. Listen to me real good, church, especially you young people. If you want to be an eagle people and you're saved by the grace of God, it's going to take some time. They that wait upon the Lord. In other words, you're going to have to hunker down, get underneath your pastor. Whether he Listen, he, he, may, he may preach the paint off the walls, uh, leave gallbladders and guts all over the floor. Uh, he may stomp your toes, pierce your heart, uh, pin his ears back, get a set of leather lungs. Uh, and whether you like it, lump it, bump it, or jump it, baby, uh, shout, powder, pass out. Uh, it's time to hang in there uh, and become an eagle people. Uh, and whatever the man of God preaches, uh, as he backs it up, with the King James Bible, uh, look up to the heavens and say, God, uh, it's hard, uh, it's gonna be difficult, uh, but let God be true and all men liars. Uh, hey, God, I wanna be an eagle people. Uh, I'm not gonna jump and run and run away from my church. Uh, I'm gonna stay where you planted me. Uh, I'm gonna be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Uh, I want to produce fruit uh, when it's time in God. Uh, I wanna be an eagle people, so I ain't going nowhere, baby. I ain't going nowhere. It takes time to produce greatness. Right. See, you won't be a chicken, run around all over town, church hopping, um, running away from the truth, not changing anything. Uh, hey, be a chicken the rest of your life. Uh, but God wants some eagles to rise up. Uh, God's looking for an eagle generation uh, and an eagle people uh, to put away childish things uh, and rear up, raise up them wings uh, and soar like an eagle. That's what God wants. God spoke the sun and the stars into existence. He spoke and the fish began to swim. He spoke and the animals began to walk. But God didn't speak man and woman into creation. God got down into the dust of the earth and created man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. You know why? Because greatness takes a little more time and God said, I'm gonna make something great and I'm gonna put life in that creation. And so God didn't speak you into existence. God made Adam from the dust of the earth. You ever thought about this? Adam the Bible says that God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam. Adam didn't ask for the darkest time of his life to occur. It just happened. Adam, Adam's walking through the garden one day and God said, lights out, Adam. Adam falls down, lights out. All he knows is, hey, where did this darkness come from? All he feels is pressure on his chest. He don't know what God's doing. All he knows is God said lights out and all around him it's pressure, pressure, pressure. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been there? You're walking through life, everything's good and all of a sudden God said lights out and you go into one of the deepest, darkest valleys you've ever been in your life and all you feel is pressure, pressure, pressure. Hey, that's where Adam was at. But when God opened up his eyes and God turned the lights back on, Adam saw what God was up to the whole time and he saw that beautiful creature called Eve. Hey, I don't know why you're in the valley that you're in. I don't know what you're going through, but I will tell you this. When God brings you out of the valley and God turns the lights back on in your life, you're gonna see that he was up to something beautiful. I don't know about it now, baby, but I know Romans 8, 28 is still in the book and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God to them with a call according to his purpose. Right now it may be dark, but joy is coming in the morning. It's coming. Yeah. Did you know the eagles are solitary birds? They fly alone. You don't see flocks of them flying around in the sky. Eagles fly by themselves. Now listen to me. I believe God is looking for a man, woman, boy, or girl who whether they're persecuted whether they are, whether they are, are talked about, 
I believe God's looking for men and women who are not afraid to stand, walk, run, or fly alone if need be. I'm not talking about leaving your local church. We've already established that you need to be faithful to your local church. But sometimes you can't take the preacher with you. You can't take the Sunday school teacher with you. Sometimes you've got to leave church and go fly by yourself down there in that schoolhouse. You may have to fly by yourself down there at the factory. You may have to fly by yourself when you meet your spouse back at the house. But God says if you'll wait upon him, you can mount up with wings as eagles and even though you may have to fly all by yourself keep on flying and keep on going forward and be an eagle people all them boys I stood back to back with in them bar rooms all them boys as you walk into that clubhouse and they put them patches on your back and you got to pledge an allegiance to give your life for that club and many times it happened and I literally have been shot at I've been cut I've been left for dead I've had a gun. My wife was with me one night. I had a gun put to my forehead and the man was trying to pull the trigger and God wouldn't let the trigger go off. Wrestled him to the ground. The gun flew out. I went outside, pulled the trigger and the gun went off. I'm telling you, all them guys uh, that stood behind me, Brother Smith, uh, all them guys that told me they had my back uh, and I had their back uh, and we did dope together and we drank together and we caroused and fought together uh, and stood back to back in all them places. Uh, Hey, when I got saved by the grace of God uh, and walked into that clubhouse and turned in my colors, uh, they weren't real happy about it. Uh, Come to find out they didn't have my back uh, and I had to leave that clubhouse uh, and fly by myself. Uh, I was going through detox, uh, going through withdrawal for them eight hard core weeks. Not a single one of them hell's angels, not a single patch holder from the coalition came to my house and said, hey man, anything we can do to help you out while you're going through withdrawal? Would you like some of your dope money back? Hey, would you like some of the years back that you wasted? Can we help put your marriage back together? Hey, can we help rub your head? Give you something to help you calm your pain? Oh no. You know what I found out when I turned them colors in and said I believed in Jesus Christ? I had to walk out of there all by myself and serve the Lord all by myself but honey whether whether they go with me or whether they stay at home I'm telling you this old boy right here is serving the Lord Jesus Christ I am going to serve him if I gotta serve him all by myself and I believe you feel the same way now be real careful when God starts using you young people listen don't get all puffed up with pride when God starts using you Don't go around bragging that, oh, I'm an eagle, people, and you're not. It ain't like that. You remember when Peter walked on the water? Do you remember when, you know, one time I was was trying to witness to an old windbag and his old hag wife. They were nasty, boy. I'm talking about just mean-spirited people. I'm trying to witness to him because he was doing some work on one of my guitars. He was a musician. And I started witnessing to him, and I said, man, you need to get in church. I'm going to invite you. I was being nice about it. I ain't always mean. And I was being nice. I said, man, you ought to come down to church. He said, I ain't got to go to church. The Lord's the Lord of the Sabbath. You know how that crap junk is. I almost said crap in the pulpit. (laughs) My mom is watching. She's going to crucify me. Crud is what I meant to say. That's a good Christian cuss word. Crud. (laughs) Have you ever said that word from the pulpit? No. He started, he started justifying why he didn't have to go to church. And then he looks at me. He says, I bet you think you can walk on water, don't you? My wife steps up. She said, he can. I went, yeah, I can. Tell him how. He said, yeah, tell me how. My wife said, that water is the word of God. She said, the Bible says that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. She said, my husband and I walk on water every day, sir. You might want to think about trying it. I said, yeah, that's what I was going to say too. (laughs) Mess with me and her together. (laughs) Praise God. God, listen, God allowed Peter to walk on the water just far enough to prove that you can do it and let him sink just far enough to where he wouldn't go around bragging about it. You never hear Peter walking around talking about the water walking ministry. You never hear him mention it ever again in the New Testament. He doesn't doesn't put a great big sign on the side of his trailer that says Peter the water walker. 
He doesn't go around charging 10 cents a head to come see, I'll sign your Bible because I'm the water walker. Let me sign the water walker of the apostle Peter. He's not bragging about, you never hear him talking about it. All Jesus did, he reached down and picked Peter up and saved him when he began to sink. You know what you find the apostle Peter doing in the book of Acts? He's walking along and he sees a lame man who's screaming alms for the poor. And Peter looks at him, he doesn't say, hey, hey, I'm, I'm sorry that you got knees, but you know I walked on the water. Let me tell you about the time I walked on the water. And hey man, if you got a minute, I'll tell you about the time I walked on the water. I'm the only person ever walked on the water other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the water walker. He never mentions it. You know what the apostle Peter does? Because he's an eagle people. The apostle Peter looks down at that man. He says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he reaches down and lifts that. I wonder where he got that from. He got it back here when he was sinking and Jesus reached down and picked him up. He's just doing for somebody else what Jesus did for him. It wasn't about water walking ministries. It was simply about proving that God wanted to use that eagle man to pick somebody up because he was picked up. So, hey, you know what I'm doing tonight? I'm just telling you that God can do the same thing for you that he did for me. I ain't bragging on being an eagle. I'm telling you my God can do it with anybody here. It's bad when I put stuff in my hands when I preach because I about threw that. And it felt good. <laughs> Listen to me. I say to all y'all eagle people, it is time to quit acting like a chicken. Yeah. Time to quit acting like a chicken. Did you know chickens can barely fly? They can, in fact, somebody told me, I don't know if it's true, you can look it up. The world record flight for a chicken is like 45 seconds. That's it. And that's the, with the wind picking it up. You don't, see eagle, you don't see chickens soaring around in the sky. All they do is strut around and act like they're something when they ain't nothing but a chicken. They walk around in a barnyard, can't even fly over the fence. Did you know that eagles eat meat? Chickens don't? Uh-oh. Did you know that eagles eat meat? They're meat eaters. They will, they will kill and eat. It's about time somebody start killing something and eating it. I say, the world and the devil want to make a chicken out of you. Stay with me. I'm heading somewhere and I'll be done quick. The world does not want you young people staying pure, getting married virgins. They want you to go out and try everything you can and sow your wild oats. Hey, the devil does not want you young people surrendering to God, you men getting called to preach, and you ladies surrendering to a mission field or marrying a husband that wants to be a man of God. They don't want you to abstain from alcohol. They want you to try everything, live off the government and depend upon the government and defy authority. They don't want you serving God, being faithful and tithing and dressing right and talking right. The devil in the world wants to make a chicken out of you and the devil will convince you that you can never be an eagle. But I'm telling you, if you'll wait upon the Lord, you'll renew your strength and you can mount up with wings as eagles. My dad passed away a year ago this month, Memorial Day will be a year. My dad left me some books. And Dr. Smith, I was reading through one of his books and I just found an article. And I just made a copy of it. And I'm going to read this article to you. And I'm going to give you an illustration and I'll be done. I, this go, I think this goes perfect with my message. I'm going to read it to you word for word the way I read it out of the, out of the book. An old story has been passed down from one generation to another through the black preaching tradition. It's about a man who was hiking in the hills near his home one day and found a strange looking egg. This man happened to own a poultry farm, so he placed this strange looking egg in the incubator to be hatched with the other eggs. In time, this strange looking egg produced a strange looking bird. And so it was that even though it had a peculiar air about it and was obviously out of place among the other birds, the farmer decided that he would raise the bird like a chicken since chickens were all he had ever raised. Soon, because all this bird ever saw were chickens, because all he was ever given to eat was chicken feed, because day in and day out he was treated like a chicken, 
because the only name he was ever called was chicken, this bird began to act like a chicken. He lost his peculiar air and no longer seemed so out of place. One day a visitor came to the farm and while he was walking through the yard, he saw the strange looking bird. He walked up to the farmer and asked him why he had an eagle living amongst his chickens. The farmer replied, well, he may look like an eagle, but I have raised him to be a chicken. He lives among chickens. He eats like a chicken. The only life he knows is the life of a chicken. So a chicken is all he'll ever be. The visitor said, you cannot callously tamper with the soul of God's creation. God has placed within this bird the seeds for greatness, and you have confined it to the barnyard. However, no creature that God has intended for flying in lofty places is beyond redemption, no matter how long it's been in the barnyard. This bird may have, been, had the, may have the habits of a chicken, but deep down within where your environment can't reach, God has placed the heart and the soul of an eagle. The visitor lifted the eagle and he said, God did not create you to be a chicken. God created you to be an eagle. So stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle took off from the visitor's hand. But as it was ascending, the farmer threw some chicken feed on the ground and the eagle flew right back to the ground and started eating the feed. The farmer looked at the visitor and said, I told you, he ain't nothing but a chicken. At this point, the visitor took the eagle. He climbed to the top of the barn where the eagle could see a little more of the countryside. And behold, that there was a world beyond the barnyard. He told the eagle a second time, God did not create you to be a chicken, but an eagle. So stretch forth your wings and fly. Again, the bird took off, ascending. And again, the farmer threw chicken feed to the ground. And again, the eagle turned back, saw the chicken feed, flew down to the ground. And the farmer once more turned to the visitor and said, I told you, he ain't nothing but a chicken. And a chicken is all he'll ever be. Refusing to give up, the visitor asked the farmer if he could try one more time. Early the next morning, while it was yet dark, the visitor placed the eagle under his arm and started climbing up a high mountain. As he approached the summit of the mountain, the sun was beginning to break the darkness of the eastern horizon. The visitor pointed the eagle toward the rising sun and said a third time, You were not created to be a chicken, but an eagle, so stretch forth your wings and fly. The rays of the rising sun struck the piercing gleam in the eagle's eye. His body began to tremble with pulsating energy and with one great leap on outstretched wings, the eagle flew away toward the dawning of the new day, not looking back, not looking down, only toward the greatness that God intended. That story reminded me of the time that I was in the devil's barnyard. He had convinced me that a chicken is all I'd ever be. He had convinced me that I'd never get off of drugs. He convinced me I'd never get out of the methadone clinic. He had convinced me that I'd be hooked on alcohol. I'd never get out of the motorcycle club. He had convinced convinced me that I'd never be a good dad. I'd never be a fit husband. He had convinced me that everything in my life was going to continue to be uh, terrible and my life would never pan out to anything. And he had convinced me that a chicken is all I'd ever be the rest of my life. But October the 27th, 2003, about 9.30 in the morning, a visitor came my way and he put me up underneath his arms and he took me to a hill called Calvary. Are you listening to me? And he pointed me toward the rising of the sun and his name is Jesus. And the sun began to pierce my my eyes and my body and my soul began to tremble and I got born again and at that moment I began to take off and I began to wait on the Lord and I'm not looking back. I've come too far to turn back now, baby. I'm not going back to the barnyard. Hey, I can't tell you that sometimes the devil hasn't thrown some of that chicken feet on the ground and said, hey, Barry, do you remember the good times? Hey, don't you remember the power that you had with them colors on your back? Don't you remember when that cocaine used to go up your nose and and that warm feeling that would flood your body. Don't you remember putting that heroin in your veins and how you'd feel so good and all oh, the good feeling that you had when you don't have them bar rooms getting drunk and getting high. Don't you remember that? And I'm going to tell you there's a side of me that wants to look back, but that side, that God side, that eagle side says don't turn back. Don't look back. You keep on going, boy. You keep on flying with the eagles. I'm not going back to the barnyard. Some of y'all, you've been saved. God, you've been to Calvary. You remember when the visitor came your way? 
You remember when the rising of the sun pierced your eyes and your body began to tremble, you repented of your sins and you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you began to wait upon the Lord and you began to try to fly like an eagle and you remember all those times. But some of you here, every time the devil throws a little bit of chicken feed back on the ground, you're turning back and you're looking back and you're going right back to the barnyard and you're living like a chicken when you got eagle inside of you. It's time to tap into it, baby. It's time to quit living like a chicken and stay out of the barnyard and spread your wings and fly like an eagle. I'll give you this, I'm done. I'd been saved, Dr. Smith, maybe about a year, a year and a half. I was completely off of everything, including the methadone. So it had to have been about a year and a half because I was serving God. I was singing in the choir. I was getting ready to, to be the youth pastor at my local church. And I remember I woke up on a Saturday. I was sitting there praying for this boy. I used to, Right, he was my best friend. His name's Mike. He, he, him and his wife both got killed this past uh, uh, Christmas on their motorcycle. He was the president of one of the chapters of the motorcycle gang that I got saved out of. And him and his wife both got killed this past um, Christmas on their motorcycle. Got hit head on by another vehicle. And their daughter is now going to my church. Y'all pray for her. Her name is Sam. But at the time, um, Mike had been my best friend. I'd been out of the club for about a year and a half, maybe going on two years. And the Holy Spirit said, you need to go witness to Mike. And so I went to Mike's house, but nobody was there. And so I had a handful of tracks. I began to stick tracks all over his house. He's lived in a mobile home. I'm putting them in the windows and the door. I'm putting them in the tree bark. I mean, everywhere, under rocks. I mean, I probably put at least 80 to 100 gospel tracks in this dude's yard. You talk, I mean, it looked like I just confettied it. As I'm pulling back out, this is my, I'm done with this. As I'm pulling back out of his house, it's about a three-mile drive. And I'm sitting there at the edge of the main road where I'm going to turn left and go to my house. And as I look down, there's a bag of cocaine laying right beside my vehicle. I can't make this stuff up. The devil never gave me drugs before I got saved. I had to pay for them. You had to pawn something, steal something, sell something. You know what I'm talking about? But this particular day, I looked down and there's an eight ball of cocaine. Hopefully you don't know what that means, but it's enough to get high for a couple of days. And I picked that up like an idiot and I looked at it and I knew exactly where it came from. I knew the packaging in it. I knew the fella that lived down the street there and, it, and I knew that it had probably fallen out of his pocket on one of his motorcycle trips. And so I picked it up and I looked at it and I, I would love to tell you that it was an easy decision to just put that down. There was no problem with it. But see, that was one of my drugs of choice. And there was two, there's two sides to you even after you get saved. You've got a spiritual side and a fleshy side. We're still living and the old man, even though the old man is dead, he likes to rear up his ugly head sometimes. Dr. Smith, I sat there and I, I looked, I don't know how long I stared at it, but one side of me said, you know, you could do some of that drug, that drug and you could, you know, everybody trusts you. You could go get a motel room for a couple days, get you some beer, and you could enjoy the high life again. No one would ever know it. Come back, tell everybody you had a sinus attack or your allergies are messed up. God will forgive you. Your wife will never know about it. Hey, just one more time. Come on back to the barnyard. God's on the other side saying, boy, I saved you out of that mess. You better keep going forward. The devil said, God will forgive you. And God said, yeah, I'll forgive you, but don't be deceived. Whatever a man soweth, that shall also reap. Uh, you're not going to get away with it. You'll pay the price. And the devil said, yeah, it won't be a big price. And God said, the price will be a whole lot bigger than what you think. And there was a war going on. The apostle Paul said, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I sat there and I looked at that dope. And man, out of nowhere, the Holy Ghost said, you too dumb to do this. You've come too far to turn back. And boys, I put her in drive and I went about 50 mile an hour down Sessions Road. I dumped an eight ball of cocaine out on that paved highway and sang victory in Jesus the whole way home. I can take you to the spot where I pulled in my driveway and I put her in park and stepped out of my vehicle, fell flat on my face and I began to feel the presence of God like I'd never felt in my life. I could barely breathe. The Holy Ghost was squeezing on my chest and God Almighty began to tell me, Hey boy, if you'll stay out of the barnyard, if you'll quit going back to the barnyard and you'll keep soaring like an eagle and quit living like a chicken, if you can put away those things, I'll put a Bible into your arm. I'll let you pastor a church. I'll let you evangelize. I'll use you, boy, if you'll quit going back to the barnyard. Hey, that was 17 years ago. I may not be what I ought to be, but I ain't what I used to be. And God's been, you know why? Because I'm not going back to the barnyard. Some of y'all need to stay out. Stand with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, as Dr. Smith comes, 
these young people, Lord, I'm trying to impress upon their hearts to stay out of the hog pen. Stay out of the chicken pen. Spread their wings and fly like an eagle. God, give us a generation of people who will put away this world, focus in on Jesus, and stop allowing the old devil to throw that chicken feed down. It's hurting marriages, God. It's ruining people's lives. And we have the power to overcome the world. You've given it to us. Lord, I pray that tonight somebody would just remember you want them to be an eagle people. Get out of the barnyard. Stay away from the sins of this world in Jesus' name. As they begin to sing and play, as Pastor Smith comes, I believe with all my heart, the majority of us here are probably say there's probably a handful who's not. And it's the Holy Ghost's job to convince you of your, that you need Jesus. I'm gonna tell you this right now. I wouldn't leave here lost. And if I was playing around, the, the other man of God's already mentioned it, the preacher that preached before me. If there's stuff in your life that you're holding on to, it's time to give it up. You want the power of God in your life. You want it to be more than words. You want to really make an impact in your school and in your job and in your church. It's time to quit going back to the barnyard. Let me say this. One of the easiest things the devil will use to pull you back to the barnyard is called a cell phone. It's called a cell phone. You may not be drinking and shooting up drugs, I'm going to tell you. We're still gossiping and slandering and looking at pornography and listening to the wrong stuff. That cell phone can be a blessing or it can be a burden. And many of you, many of you keep going back to the barnyard through an iPhone or an Android. I say it's time to clean up and become an eagle people.